This lesson deals with complex power. You can find these notes in the ECE 202 ebook in chapter 16, starting on page 3. As we saw in chapter 8, Kirchhoff's voltage law, Kirchhoff's current law, and eventually Ohm's law were mapped from the time domain to the frequency domain in such a way that we're able to analyze AC circuits very much like we did DC circuits. Is there something similar for power? In the last video, we took a look at the voltage across and the current into a two-terminal element and defined its voltage as V sub A and an angle of theta sub V. Putting that in RMS, we're dividing the peak by the square root of 2. Did the same thing for the current in terms of its peak current divided by the square root of 2, and then the angle was theta sub I. Suppose that we multiply the voltage and the current in the frequency domain and see if we get results similar to the time domain. So we get the two amplitudes multiplying, and then we add the two angles. And of course, this would mean in rectangular form that we're going to take the cosine of this combination of angles plus j times the sine of the same quantity and multiply it by the amplitude here of VRMS times IRMS. This looks very much like P and Q we had in our previous video, but the sign here is the opposite. We had a minus sign. So multiplying voltage and current in the frequency domain does not correlate what we found in the time domain relative to the instantaneous power. Is there a way to fix that up? Well, we could change the sign of the angle of the current by taking its conjugate. In other words, the current was IRMS at an angle of theta sub i, and if we take the conjugate of that, that puts a minus sign over here. I was replacing j by minus j. And that j would come back inside the sine of theta sub i. Putting that into rectangular form, we'd have the cosine of theta sub i, because the cosine's an even function, the minus sign doesn't have an effect. In other words, the cosine of plus 45 is the same as minus 45. And then the sine of minus theta sub i, the minus sign comes out because the sine function is an odd function. In other words, the sine of 45 degrees is the negative of the sine of minus 45 degrees. So if we multiply the voltage times the current conjugate in the frequency domain, that would be VRMS times IRMS times the angle of theta sub V minus the angle of theta sub I. And we call this theta. In rectangular form, this would be the amplitude in RMS times the cosine of theta plus J times that same amplitude times the sine of theta. And that would be our P plus JQ. Power in the frequency domain is related to power in the time domain. Let's define some terms. Let's call the product of voltage times current conjugate the apparent power. And we're going to use the symbol S, but not with a phasor bar over it, just simply the symbol S. Now we're multiplying voltage and current, so we're going to have a lot of terms here that we could call the same unit, but we want to distinguish each of the terms. So we're going to call the apparent power units volt amperes. We take the product of voltage and current conjugate, we'll have a real part plus J and imaginary part. We could also express it in terms of polar form with a magnitude and an angle. Of course, that would be the RMS voltage times the RMS current, and then the angle of theta. The term P we're going to call real power or average power, and the units here we're going to use just like in the time domain is watts. And the reason for this is that when you look at the instantaneous power, there are two terms that have sines and cosines, and so their average values are zero. And so the only term that's left over is just the P that's added to those other two terms. The term Q we're going to call reactive power. It's the term that multiplies J. And the units here we're going to use to distinguish it are volt amperes reactive. The cosine of theta, we're also going to call the power factor, or just PF for short. And the sine of theta, we're going to call the reactive power factor, or RF for short. And then the angle theta is called the power factor angle. You should note here that all of our power calculations are done with voltage and currents expressed in RMS and not peak values. Since the cosine function is an even function, we wouldn't be able to tell whether the cosine of theta, which is our power factor, was done with an angle theta that was positive or negative. So we define this with one more term. If the current leads the voltage, then the angle of theta would be between 0 and minus 90 degrees, because again we're taking the angle of the voltage minus the angle of the current. That would be a circuit that looks capacitive. So we'll use the word leading, like we did in chapter 8, for this relationship, the current leading the voltage. We'll call that a leading power factor. If the angle of theta, which is the angle of voltage minus the angle of current in our original problem, is between 0 and 90, that means that the current is lagging behind the voltage. And our circuit will be looking inductive, so we'll call this a lagging power factor. Because our complex power is a complex number, we can plot it so we have a real part and an imaginary part. And if we had a lagging power factor, the angle of theta would be between 0 and 90, and it would put us with a magnitude somewhere in the first quadrant. Don't use the arrowhead on power, just on the voltage and current. If we had a leading power factor, the angle of I would be greater than the angle of V, and we get a negative value for theta. 
So we call this a power triangle in that it's going to be in the first quadrant if we have an inductive circuit, and it'll be in the fourth quadrant if we have a capacitive circuit. For DC, when we calculated power, we did it as voltage times current, but we also did I squared R and V squared over R. It's for something similar in the frequency domain. Let's again take the voltage times the current conjugate as our complex power, and let's use Ohm's law now and replace V by Z times I. I is equal to the magnitude, and then we have an angle. The magnitude is going to be an RMS now, and the angle was theta sub I, and then the conjugate has a minus theta sub I. So when you multiply these two together, the angles add and we get zero. We end up getting the magnitude squared times the value of Z. Now, what is Z? Z has a real and imaginary part, so we'll call it R plus JX, and then again, we're multiplying by the RMS squared. If we multiply this through then, we have the real part is R times IRMS squared, and the imaginary part is X times IRMS squared. So this is very much like our DC formula of I squared R, but now we have a real part and an imaginary part, and then we'll have a real power, and we'll have a reactive power term. We also did the second form, of Ohm's law, and that is I is equal to V divided by Z. So if we're going to take the conjugate of I, that would be the voltage conjugate divided by the impedance conjugate. Okay, so we got the voltage with a magnitude of V RMS and an angle of theta sub V, and its conjugate would have the same amplitude in RMS, and then the angle would have the minus sign. So when you multiply these together, the angles will add, and they'll give us zero. We'll get the magnitude squared. Write that as the phasor's magnitude squared, or just simply V RMS squared. And then the conjugate of our impedance would then be a minus jx, so r minus jx. Now let's multiply by the complex conjugate to just get a real denominator. So we're going to get r squared, and we're going to get x squared, and then the j squared, and then another minus sign. And then the inner product terms cancel. So we get r squared plus x squared. That's going to multiply then by r times our magnitude squared, and multiply jx times the same quantity, the rms squared divided by r squared plus x squared. This will calculate complex power correctly, but it doesn't look like our formula from our time domain calculations. So although this is correct, you might find that most of the time people will use the previously defined formula of R times I squared plus J times X I squared. And again, our phasors now will be an RMS. If we do that, then we have formulas pretty much like our time domain. That's the one thing to note here. If we take the ratio of voltage to current, that would be the impedance looking into our original box. And that would be our voltage phasors magnitude at an angle of theta sub V, and then our current would have the magnitude of IRMS, and then the angle would be theta sub I, but then the numerator minus the denominator angle would give us a minus sign, and that is our value of theta. So our, our use of the impedance formulas, again, look very similar to what we had previously if we define power as voltage times current conjugate. And these are some of the properties of complex power.